The long 18th century was a time of increasing professionalism and complexities for the military powers of Europe. Armies and navies were getting larger, technologies and doctrines were evolving. But not everyone who took up arms was a professional warrior. Many of them were everyday average civilians. They were farmers and shopkeepers, laborers and even gentlefolk who, when their time came, would march to the beat of a military drum. So join me in this series where I'll be exploring the citizen soldiers of the 18th century. The supremacy of the British Royal Navy has rarely been so secure as they would have liked it to be. Throughout the long 18th century, a serious threat of invasion had existed on numerous occasions, and every once in a while, small numbers of enemy soldiers would even find themselves on British soil. And so it came that the British public, the nation of shopkeepers so hostile to the concept of large standing armies, would perhaps one day need to defend themselves against the real thing. And one of the many responses to these threats of invasion came in the form of the Fensible Regiments. Their name, perhaps unsurprisingly, came from the word defensible, and they represented a sort of early military reserve, bodies of troops that were raised on a temporary basis explicitly for home service during times of threat. But before we come to them in detail, we'll have a quick and poorly segued message on behalf of this video's sponsor, NordVPN. Well, would you look at that? It's everybody's favorite recurring sponsorship character and his majesty's newest volunteer, Little Timmy. Hello, I'm off to Flanders, Portugal, and Spain. Oh, I'm sure it'll be a swell time. Well, that's just swell, Little Timmy. I'm sure you'll love it, uh, but I hope you've remembered to pick a subscription service to NordVPN up before your journey. Nord? What's that? Why, NordVPN is a virtual private network. It helps you to digitally change your IP address to almost anywhere in the world with a click of a button. Oh, well, uh, that's fun, but... Why do I need that? Why, to get around region-blocked materials, of course! How else are you going to stream all your favorite content from back home while you're fighting for the king in Spain? Oh, goodness, I hadn't considered that! And we all know that streaming TV shows is definitely one of the most important parts of being in Wellington's army. And what's more, NordVPN will help to protect you from any nasty malware and other harmful sites. You never know what those dastardly Bonapartists are getting up to after all, right? And when you visit the link in the description, you can even get up to four months of NordVPN free of charge with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Nord has been my VPN of choice for a few years now, and it's been particularly useful when I'm traveling abroad, or even when I'm just going to reenactments and relying on old dodgy hotel Wi-Fi. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video, and now, back to the Fensible. Now, technically, these men weren't a militia force. They were army regiments, but they were temporary. They were raised on an ad hoc basis, uh, often by members of the local nobility, in response to individual threats. And when those threats dissipated, well, the fensible service no longer being required, the regiments would usually be disbanded. But they were still recruited in much the same way as soldiers of the regular line regiments, including being offered an enlistment bounty for joining up, and they were commanded by regular army officers, although those arm our army officers were ranked junior to their line counterparts. Uh, so if you have any two officers who are otherwise of the same rank, well, the officer in the regular regiment would be superior to that in the fensible regiment, although uh, the fensibles in turn did take precedence over the militia. As far as their appearance is concerned, given their often temporary status, we don't have all too many records to go off of, at least when compared with the other line regiments. But what we do have indicates that the Fensibles would largely be uniformed and equipped in pretty much the same style and manner as any other forces. Uh, there are some great examples cited in A History of the Uniforms of the British Army by Cecil C. P. Lawson. For example, he describes the uniform of an officer from the Royal Essex Fencibles in 795 as a scarlet coat faced in buff with silver embroidered buttonholes, buff waistcoats and breeches, silver laced hat with a white feather with red on top for the battalion officers, 
He carries on to provide uniforms to the musicians, the drummers, and fifers, for the pioneers even to wear bearskin caps when the regiment was under arms, as well as leather aprons and their tools. And then, of course, the privates of the various different kinds of companies, pretty much exactly what you'd expect based on the color scheme previously provided. And much like the regular army, most of this outfitting was being done on a regimental level, with many goods being purchased by the regiment's colonel or other officers who were then paid back by the men themselves through stoppages in pay. Uh, although, as these men were inherently less disciplined and professional than the line regiments, things did occasionally get a little messy there and in other regards as well. Like, for example, in 1779, during the American War of Independence, and yes, there was actually a legitimate fear of invasion by France during the American War, well, when there was a short-lived mutiny by men of the Western Fencibles. It was a Scottish regiment under Colonel the Lord Frederick Campbell, who had originally purchased the regiment's sporans, however you pronounce that word, from an expensive tailor down in London for which he charged his men three shillings and eight pence each. The soldiers, in defense of their wallets, insisted that the equivalent quality could be found locally at only one shilling eight pence apiece. And so, I'm sure there's a lot of other factors going into it as well, but that was at least the official reason for a mutiny. There were different kinds of fencibles as well, there being both infantry and cavalry fencible regiments. And likewise, within those infantry regiments, much like in the traditional line, there were distinctions between the battalion men, the light infantry, and the grenadiers. Uh, there were even fencible musicians and fencible pioneers. Uh, they were structured basically in the same overall way as any other regiment in, in like the, the regular permanent standing army. They were just designed with a very specific and limited purpose. As I mentioned, the fencibles were generally only liable for domestic service. Uh, they were intended to supply manpower at home so that the main, more professional army could dedicate more of its forces to foreign service. Uh, their duties often included garrisoning towns and fortifications, guarding military assets, and of course, plenty of manual labor. Uh, if an invasion ever did come, it would likely be uh, the fencibles. It would fall to them to start making sure that things like the roads were clear for evacuation, throwing up temporary defenses, all those sorts of things. And this purpose was well put by the British Military Library, a sort of journal of different articles, charts, and statements about the state of the British Army, uh, which in a section on the history of the fencibles described their recently being raised for the wars against revolutionary France. His Majesty thought proper in 1792 to raise a formidable army to be employed on the continent under the Duke of York and to deprive our enemies of their possessions in the East and West Indies. And in the accomplishment of this measure, it was deemed necessary for the defense of the three kingdoms to have a body of troops independent of the militia in the absence of the regulars. Letters of service were accordingly issued in 1793 to raise fencible regiments of infantry. Now, the fencibles weren't local forces. They weren't explicitly recruited from individual towns and cities, uh, nor were they restricted in their deployment to any one community. When a man joined the fencibles, he could expect a great deal of marching, just like any other kind of soldier. It's just that he wouldn't be going to any places that would be all that strange to him when compared with, say, you know, uh, what, over the hills of far away, Flanders, Portugal, Spain, nothing like that, you know. Uh, for the most part, plenty of exceptions, but for the most part, English fencible regiments are going to be generally serving in England, Scottish regiments in Scotland, and Irish in Ireland, so on and so forth. The only way that a fencible man would serve abroad would be if he volunteered to do so, although such volunteering wasn't necessarily rare. Not only was it a more exciting life than dreary old garrison jobs, you get all the, you know, all the drawbacks of military discipline without any of the perks of foreign adventurism, uh, but it was also, uh, usually if you volunteered for foreign service, you would get an additional bounty and some higher wages as well. So there was a number of benefits to signing up. For example, in March of 1800, 33 fencible regiments in Ireland were asked to turn out 12 active young men each as volunteers to serve in the newly established Corps of Riflemen. Around the same time, five different Scottish regiments were ordered to be replenished by volunteers from the many different uh, Scottish fencibles who also happened to be serving in Ireland at the time. 
and for every 50 fensible volunteers that came, the colonels in command of those regiments were permitted to recommend one of their officers for an ensigncy in the line. It's quite a promotion indeed, with plenty more opportunity for advancement than home service would ever allow. There were even some instances of fensible regiments themselves going abroad to fight, like the whole regiment, uh, pretty much the opposite of what they were raised to begin with, uh, but again, that was always on a voluntary basis. Uh, although, since I had just mentioned Scottish fencibles in particular, it's worth noting something particular about them, uh, being that until 1797, when for obvious reasons things were getting kind of desperate, uh, there were no organized militia in Scotland. There were only fencibles. Uh, as Richard Holmes puts it in his book Redcoats, this was not least because of the risk of distributing weapons to a society that had only recently been disarmed, being, you know, due to the whole Jacobite nonsense just a generation or two prior. There, in fact, is one of few invasions against which the Fencibles actually saw action, as recorded in the rather colorful language of, once again, the British Military Library, when the House of Stuart was made the dupe of France during the War of 1741 and attempted an invasion of Scotland in order to throw the British nation into confusion and oblige it to recall its troops from the continent, among other means of resisting the pretender's army, several regiments of fencibles, though not exactly called so, were raised by the voluntary offer of some spirited noblemen and gentlemen. If you're interested in any one uh, regiment of fencibles and the history of their service, I know that it's kind of anathema to say so, but honestly, I'd, I'd recommend that you look at the Wikipedia article, uh, because there you can find a pretty comprehensive, a really good list of all the different regiments, where they were raised, who led them, where they served, how large they were, all that fun stuff. Uh, there were also a number of fencible regiments in other parts of the empire that you can find listed there, uh, most noteworthy in Canada, where uh, a lot of them saw service during the War of 1812, not surprisingly. Uh, and, of course, uh, if you're interested in reading more about any of this stuff, well, you can find all the sources that I used in this video, as well as some additional reading in the description down below, and by visiting nativeoak.org slash library, where I'll post a couple of primary sources as well. And that, my friends, is all I really have to say about the fencibles. But oh, how remiss I would be if I didn't cover their nautical friends, the Sea Fencibles. That's right, the Navy had them too, but only for a brief time, from 1798 up until 1810. The brainchild of Captain Sir Home Popham, great name, the Sea Fencibles were to consist of all such of the inhabitants of the towns and villages of Great Britain as shall voluntarily offer themselves for the defense of the coast. The sea fencibles in any given area were under the command of naval lieutenants, and those lieutenants in turn would fall under the wider command of a captain who would control a district. Much like their landsmen counterparts, the sea fencibles were there to free up manpower for the navy and royal marines, theoretically at least, you'll see what I mean, uh, garrisoning port towns and shore defenses. Most notably, they were helping to man the long strings of fortifications that the British put up as independent strong points from which to resist French invasion, at least in its hypothetical initial stages. Although ultimately, these towers and the sea fencibles themselves would never have much opportunity to prove themselves as the invasion never came. But if you're interested at all in learning about these Italian-inspired Martello towers, how and why they were built, and how they were used, I recommend checking out the channel The Ministry for History, where my friend Daryl has a great video all about them. And this footage as well comes from him, so thank you to Daryl. Uh, some other, perhaps more uh, practical duties of the Sea Fencibles included things like manning coastal signaling stations and assisting the Revenue Service to combat smuggling. Uh, they also operated a small number of gunboats, uh, some of which were private ships and others supplied to them, uh, which they would use to theoretically harass enemy barges during any theoretical landing operations. For the most part, though, few of these men ever saw more action than exchanging distant fire with the occasional French privateer. Still, though, at the height of their power in 1810, just before their disbandment, uh, there were just under 24,000 thousand men with the sea fencibles, each collecting a shilling a day while on service. Uh, but for many, the, the pay, low as it was, it wasn't really why they were uh, joining up. There was another pull for enlistment with the sea fencibles, and that was their security. Much like the land service, sailors with the sea fencibles were not liable to serve abroad, and most significantly, that included on the man -o wars meaning that if you were in the sea fencibles, you were not liable to naval impressment. So, 
Maybe being forced to stay in one place wouldn't have worked out for the merchantmen sailors, who were always in danger of the press gangs when they're in port, but for those sailors who are fixed to one location, the fishermen, the bargemen, and the like, well, you can see how attractive this much safer and more casual service would have been to the Navy proper. There was a lot of debate during the time as to the value of the sea fencibles, not just because of their financial cost, you know, paying, outfitting, and supplying them all with, like, pikes and guns and blah 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 blah, uh, but because of their, uh, because just how many men were being pulled away from potential service with the Navy. And that's especially the case when the need to have the sea fencibles became less and less over time as the threat of French invasion declined after especially 1805. Uh, and when, you know, their own importance was inversely proportional to the strength of the Royal Navy. You know, the stronger the Navy is, the less likely there's going to be an invasion, the less need for the sea fencibles, so why not take them all and transfer? You see the idea. Basically, a lot of captains felt that all those guys could be put to much better use, and they also felt that the sea, sensible, sea fencibles were basically just being lazy. Notwithstanding the number of men who have volunteered to go afloat, it is inconceivable the difficulty I find when the time arrives to persuade them to embark. The people, who are mostly smugglers and wreckers, object to go aboard the revenue cutters. Although others, like Lord Nelson himself, spoke with more favor to the volunteers, uh, complimenting their zeal at training with the great guns, and uh, trusting that, if the situation should ever arise, that they would find the courage to do their duty. Now thank you all very much for joining me in this our brief look at the Fencibles, just one of the many different types of citizen soldier from the long 18th century. A special thank you to Pablo of the Chilean Association for the War of Independence, who was a massive help to me in finding many of the images that I used for this video. It could be really tough to find period artwork of these guys, uh, and his help there is greatly appreciated. Uh, if you're interested at all in South American history, or if you're you know, from down his way and would like to get started reenacting even, well, I'll post a link to his group below for you to check out. They look pretty good, and it's a time period history that I really know close to nothing about, so it's always interesting to see like the similarities and the differences between like their kit and the Napoleonic stuff. Of course, thank you as well to all of the generous patrons who by virtue of their financial support have made this video and all of my work possible. None of this would ever exist without them, our own glorious volunteers. And of course, thank you to you as well, my dear viewer for watching, and until the next time, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.